again, yeah, thanks for joining us tonight, Nigel. So Nigel's a self-employed ancient woodland specialist. He's been working in the environmental field for more than 30 years, including spells with the RSPB and the Woodland Trust. Um, Nigel worked for the Woodland Trust for four years as an ancient woodland restoration officer in North Wales and has spent time in hundreds of ancient woodlands throughout the area. Nigel continues to do work for the Woodland Trust in Snowdonia National Park and he's also been working several years for our own Johnny Holson, a big covert wood near Micehaven, which is near our Aberdeen and Nature Reserve, uh, working with several woodland owners to help them to begin to restore their ancient woodlands. Uh, one owner has already begun thinning trees and replanted with native broadleaves and another three are hoping to start with this winter, which is just an excellent um, good news story there. So can you, uh, you all right there, Nigel, if I start passing you over to you? Yeah, sure. That's good. Can you hear me okay, Mark? Absolutely fine. So brilliant. I'm going to I'll get rid of my face and I'll, I'll pass you over to <laughs> Nigel now for you. Okay, thank you. And uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, to talk this evening. I think um, initially um, Andy Andy Dodgson from the Woodland Trust was was going to be talking, but he was uh, unable to make it tonight. He, he has asked me to step in. Uh, so apologies to anybody who was expecting expecting Andy. You've kind of stuck with me now, I'm afraid. But uh, at least that's one of the benefits of Zoom is that at least you can get up and walk away, and I won't know this. So um, so I'm talking about uh, tonight. Going to be talking about indicators of ancient woodland. Um, so yeah, I'll wait for it to move through now. Yeah, unfortunately. Right. Okay. So I'm going to be um, starting off just by looking at what ancient woodlands are, um, the, the definitions of, of what makes an ancient woodland. I'll be having a, a little um, bit of a look at what we have around us here in, in North Wales. Um, I'll just touch on, on a few of the, the human uses of, of, of ancient woodlands um, and how we've, we've used them over time. Um, and then I'll be concentrating a bit on uh, the more traditional idea of, of ancient woodland indicators. Um, and then I'm just gonna finish up with a, with a, a bit of a pointer you know, to, to woodlands in the future. So what are ancient woodlands? Well, the actual literal definition of an ancient woodland is, is a woodland that has been continually wooded since 1600. Um, that's not to say that you know, woods that are 400 years, years old are, are more important than other woods. It's, it's more that if, if it was a, a woodland back in 1600, it probably means that there's continuity going back over hundreds, maybe thousands of years that that, that woodland um, you know, may go back to, to even as, as, as far as after the last ice age. Um, I think the 1600 is, is, is a slightly sort of arbitrary date. I think it was, it was picked because um, before 1600, there was, there was very little um, coniferous woodland that was, that was planted. Um, uh, that was planted by by people. Also, around 1600 is when we first start seeing the the, the decent uh, maps being produced. So it's a sort of a, a convenient date. Um, but but don't get too hung up in the in the 1600. I'm going to do a whiz back in time over about 18,000 years in about two minutes, just to just to set the context. So when the the ice uh, after the last ice age and and the ice sheet that that, that covered us all. When that re retreated, um, it, the, the, as, as the land started to appear from underneath the ice, um, it started to vegetate with, with grasslands and, and eventually with woodlands. We were connected to, uh, to the mainland of Europe till around uh, six or 7,000 years um, uh, BC. So, so when that land bridge um, was, was closed, that's when our sort of tree fauna, I suppose, was uh, was more or less cut off then. Um, so apologies for this slightly complicated um, graph here, but if you go back to uh, around 10,000 years ago when, when the ice sheets were first retreating, the uh, as, as the ice sheets retreated, they were being replaced by bare ground, by, by grasslands. And initially the pioneer tree species came in, the birches and the pines. I'm hoping you can all see that there. Um, and, and over time, the, the, the species that were, that were a bit um, heavier seeds and a bit more difficult to, to move, took more time to come in, the hazels, the limes, the oaks. So, um, so, so over time, our, our sort of tree fauna, uh, tree flora, sorry, um, re really changed over time. 
I've, I've put this, this sort of cut off as, as when the uh, when the ice bridge to Europe first disappeared, Brexit one, as I called it. Um, so after that, there was very little movement of, of, of any tree species in, into uh, into to the UK from from Europe after that. Um, the other thing that you can see as, as you move through time on, on this chart is, is that around 5000 BC, we start seeing the influence of, of people and, and their animals, uh, grasslands start to start to appear in the UK. Um, and eventually we start seeing arable, um, and arable land uses as well. So over, over time, as, as the grassland, as the arable takes over, the, the, the woodland quant, um, area starts to, starts to decline until eventually you get to, this is that 1600 cut off um, and after then right in the bottom you just start seeing the first conifers appearing um, in, in, in the land and also the um, the urban coverage of the lands landscape starts getting that much bigger then um, so there you go we just covered several thousand years I'm, I'm gonna uh, apologize if, if this is a little bit dry to start I, I just wanted to, to throw a couple of facts and figures at you just to, to set the context um, for ancient woodlands in, in the area so around 13% of the UK is, is made up of woodland. Um, compare that to, to the rest of Europe, the, the average is about 37%. So we're a, a relatively unwooded country as it is. Um, and only around 2% of the UK is, is, is made up of ancient woodland, a tiny, tiny proportion, considering it would have been getting up towards 100% in the past, of course. Um, in Wales, we have a little bit more than, than the UK as a whole nearly 3%, and, and in fact, we're relatively well off in, in North Wales here, around 4.5% um, is ancient woodland, but still certainly no, uh, no great shakes. And, and one of the, the big issues, which I will um, talk about a little bit more, is that of, of that relatively small amount, of that 4.5% in, in North Wales, nearly half of, of our ancient woodlands have been um, damaged in the past uh, by being felled and, and, and planted with non-native species. That, that's something I'm, I'm going to touch on a little bit as we, uh, as we go through. So where are the ancient woodlands around us? Um, at, at, the end, at the end of the talk, I, I'm going to uh, be sending out a few, few references. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that Mark will, will, will send it on to people. I'll, I'll be talking about a couple of sources where, where I get information from. Um, and hopefully some of these are sources that, that you'll be able to sort of go and look at and, and, and have a play at. There's, there's some really useful resources online. The first one is, is Data Map Wales. Um, and, and I use that because it, it has the ancient woodland inventory on that. Um, 2011 was, I'm not sure, I think it was the original, possibly the second inventory. They, it's, it's been updated sort of since. Um, but it's quite a user-friendly site. You, you can go in and you can play around with the map and you can zoom in on your local areas and, and find where your local woodlands are. Um, just as an example, this is uh, just north of, of where I live, Llangollen, um, the, the Dee I, Valley. I, Nigel, just to let yeah. you know, I've, I've put all those links in the chat ready for everyone so they're there for you, okay? Mm. Brilliant, thank you, Mark. <clears throat> so, so this is what, what you can find um, on that site. Uh, so the green areas are areas of ancient semi-natural woodland. The blue areas are plantation on ancient woodland. I'll, I'll be talking about that more. Um, and the brown areas are raws, restored ancient woodland sites. I'll, I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. The, the other site which I find really useful is, is this, uh, the National Library of Wales. And again, it has uh, really useful interactive maps. You can click on whichever county you, you want and then you can zoom in and out. Um, you can you can look at different layers, including the um, aerial aerial images uh, and including the old some of the old tithe maps, which are quite fascinating. And also particular of, of use for me is, is the old ordnance survey maps are, um, are on that as well. So another really useful site to, to, to have a look at. So so this is um, just down the road from where I live in the, in the Kerryog Valley. Um, this is the old ordnance survey maps, the original ordnance survey maps, which would date back from about the 1880s. Um, and and in, in this context and in the context of the ancient woodland inventory, the, these are really useful because they did differentiate between deciduous woodland um, and coniferous woodlands. It's a little bit hard to see on here, but, but they had different symbols for the different sort of woodlands. So when the ancient woodland inventory was first created, it was it took these original ordnance survey maps and it compared these to the 
aerial images um, and this is the the aerial image of the same area if, if you zoom in a little bit um, you can also see from the aerial images you can differentiate between what is deciduous woodland and what is coniferous woodland you can just about see the sort of broccoli look of the deciduous woodland and then the more sort of regular look of the, of the coniferous woodland and so the ancient woodland inventory pulls those two things together um, to produce an overall map so areas that were deciduous woodland back in the 1880s and are still deciduous woodland now are usually mapped as ancient semi-natural woodland which is the green on the map um, areas that were deciduous woodland then but are now coniferized um, are, are generally mapped as pores woodlands plantation on ancient woodlands and, and I'll, I'll use that that word quite a lot pause woodlands and then somewhere in between is these orange restored ancient woodlands which um, uh, a sort of step in between pause woodlands and ancient semi-natural woodlands um, also in, in that inventory some areas were marked as unknown those were usually areas which which had been woodland which had been recently felled so it was actually difficult to tell what their current status was that that's a really sort of basic summary of the ancient woodland inventory there, there's a lot of um um, additions to that. It's also been ground truthed quite a lot in recent years and, and it, it is being updated. One of the, <coughs> excuse me, one of the early anomalies was that um, it only really sort of picked up plantation, uh, conifer, conifer plantations. So uh, woodlands where the ancient woodlands had been felled and replanted with uh, trees such as beech, which, which isn't actually native in the area here. Um, those have only sort of more recently been added uh, to the inventory. Th this is um, the wood that, that Mark referred to uh, just by Mice Haven, which would have been a, a, a native woodland. It was um, in the past felled and it is now sort of 95% beech. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about, about that woodland later. Um, and, and this is some of the work that's been going on in, in, in Mice Haven, some of the thinning to, uh, to thin out the beach and, and to increase the proportion of uh, native deciduous woods in that tree. <laughs> Apologies for the picture in the bottom corner, it's the only one I could find of the, uh, um, the Wildlife Trust had a, um, a bio blitz in, uh, in, the, in the wood at Big Covert last year. Uh, yes, that's not the greatest of photos, but uh, some interesting stuff discovered there. So. When you think of ancient woodlands, this is, is the sort of thing that springs to mind, isn't it, of, of uh, you know, native deciduous woodlands, you know, hopefully full of lots of lots of wildflowers. Maybe you think of the, the sort of western oakland woodlands with uh, the mosses and lichens, these really striking sort of woodlands. But, but usually when you think of ancient woodlands, you don't necessarily think of this, which is a, a tikka plantation, but this is actually technically um, an ancient woodland. This, this was a wood which uh, in recent times was a deciduous woodland that has been felled and re replanted with Sitka spruce. I think initially there was, there was some thought that once those woods had, had been replaced, that was it, they were, they were gone forever. Um, but in, in more recent years, there's a growing realization and, and I've spent a lot of my time in, in a lot of different um, pause woodlands, plantation woodlands. And I, I, I'm yet to, to visit a woodland that doesn't have some remnant, that doesn't have some sign of, of that ancient woodland past. Um, often around the edges of the woodland where a bit more light is getting in, you might get clumps of, um, of, of native woodland plants like these bluebells. You might get areas where the trees have blown down in the wind, uh, rocky areas where, where the crops didn't quite take so well or, or boggy areas, but there's always something, there's always something, something left of that ancient woodland past. And those, those areas are incredibly important. We, we put a lot of focus on, on that areas. That's where the potential to restore woodlands uh, comes from. Probably not back to, to what they were before, but, but certainly the, there's the potential to restore them back to something a, a lot more natural than, than, than what they are now. And again, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. Um, th this, is, this is a woodland, I think it's in Powers actually, where, where that, restoration process has, has started. You, you might think initially that, that if, if it's a native woodland that's, that's been planted with conifers, then surely you just can cut down the conifers and replant it again and, and, and away you go. But, but the problem is that, <clears throat> that those sort of delicate remnants of the ancient woodland that are left, if you clear all of the conifers off, you get a big flood of sunlight coming in. Um, you get a flush of, of growth of, of bracken and bramble and, and uh, and plants like that which can actually sort of you know finish off those remnants it, it, they can completely get rid of them before the tree cover um, has a chance to get going 
So ancient woodland res restoration is, is a really gradual process of, of gradual thinning of woodlands. It's, it's a process of managing light to, uh, to allow bits more light into the woodland to, to allow those areas to flourish and to protect any sort of remaining ancient remnant, ancient woodland remnants that, that might be left. Um, before I, I, I look at ancient woodland indicators specifically, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about, about human use of woodlands because there, there's a tendency to sort of look at, 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 at beautiful woodlands and, and think that they've been these sort of quiet and peaceful refuges for, for hundreds of years. It's, it's not necessarily the case. Just, just as an example, <clears throat> uh, this is a woodland that I, I spent a bit of time in, uh, a castle woodland just outside Rithin, um, which is, is, is a large beach pause woodland, um, which, which was an, a native woodland formerly planted up with, uh, with, with largely a, a beach crop. Um, when you go into the woodlands, um, at the top of the woodland, there, there's areas where um, the limestone has, has been quarried in the past. It's, it's fairly clear to see these old limestone quarries. And this photo shows um, what would have been an old lime kiln. Um, and there's, there's a couple of those remaining in the woodland. And, and over time, as, as I spent time in woodland, we sort of started piecing together this, this historical past of, of, of what used to go on in the woodland. Um, down, in, down in the lower parts of the woodland, there's these old coppice stools. This is a lovely old elm coppice, actually, um, that show that the sign, site was obviously really quite intensely managed in the past. Um, there, are also, there are also signs of, of, of old, um, old coppice hearths, where, sorry, old charcoal hearths, where they used to take that coppiced wood um, and turn it into charcoal. Quite difficult to photograph. This is uh, this is a, an old charcoal hearth at Pinacoid, and, and if you rummage around in there, you can actually find the sort of old bits of uh, bits of burned charcoal. But from the starting point of a sort of quiet woodland where people go and, and walk their dogs, we, we sort of ended up with a woodland where they were quarrying limestone. Um, they were coppicing the woodland down down in the in the valley. Um, they were taking that coppice wood to make charcoal. That charcoal was then going up. Um, towards the quarries, they were using the charcoal to turn the limestone into lime, which would have been used either on the fields or, or, or for industrial uses. So you suddenly sort of got this, this chain of, of amazing activity that was, that was going on in, in this woodland. And, and I think that's probably fairly typical for how a lot of woodlands were. They were, they were really actively managed for, um, for hundreds of years. There are, there are also quite a few other sites of uh, other signs of, of past human use to, to be found in, in, in ancient woodlands, including in, in pause woodlands. There, there's old tracks, um, trackways like, like this one, which have probably been around for hundreds of years. Um, a lot of woodland boundaries um, still there. You, you can look at the old tithe maps that, that show field boundaries and woodland map, woodland boundaries, and they're still there to be found now, even in, sort of in amongst the, 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 the densest um, canopies of trees. <clears throat> there are also a whole host of, of other ways that woodlands were used. Um, I like this picture actually because it shows uh, one of the old saw pits that the way that they used to uh, uh, that they used to work the timber. Uh, the guy on top was called the top dog. The guy at the bottom was the underdog, and you can kind of see why we still we still use those expressions today. Um, and it is possible. I've I've only come across maybe one or two. Um, places where you can still see the old saw pits, um, just as, as a slight impression in the ground. Uh, it's, it's an interesting thing to do to sort of walk around woodlands and, and to try and pick up a picture of, of, of the evidence of, of, of what was going on in those woodlands before. Uh, these are quite difficult ones to find, but, but sometimes you find a sort of long, thin, shallow, usually with a bit of a, a drainage ditch out of it, which would have been to, uh, to drain the water out of those holes. Um, but that's that's the human use, which, which to me is 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 part of what sort of in, indicates ancient woodlands and, and you know the way that ancient woodlands were managed. I'm going to talk a little bit now about uh, what we more usually refer to as, as, as ancient woodland indicators, and, and there's a whole lot of different things um, which, which are ancient woodland indicators. I had to include my gratuitous photo of a dormouse because everybody has to really when they're talking about woodlands. Um, and and the, the, a, a couple of birds, uh, pied flycatch and, and wood warblers, which are real sort of ancient wood, ancient woodland specialist birds that, that, that you don't get outside woodlands. When I was doing a, a lot of sort of survey work of, of pause woodlands, plantation 
ancient woodlands. You, you don't see many of these sort of birds because, of course, once the trees are, are, are cut down, the birds disappear. Um, but there are other things that, that do remain in those woodlands, and, and, and those are the ones which we sort of more traditionally use as, as indicators. I'm, I'm not an expert in any way, shape or form in invertebrates. I, I, I wish I was, but there's, there's a sort of fair argument that, that, that ancient that the invertebrates are probably better as indicators of ancient woodland than, than, than plants are, but uh, it's a bit, unfortunately, a bit more of a, a specialist subject that. Um, so, so ancient woodland indicators more traditionally, of, of course, when we find old trees, it's it's, it's fairly evident that that that's you know, that those trees are certainly dating back many years. This is one of the old uh, oaks in the Crogan oak in the uh, in the Kerryog Valley here, which is probably eight nine hundred years old. Amazing old tree. Um, even in these um, coniferized pause woodlands, you do still sometimes find some of the old um, trees which which predate the, the plantation, and, and those are often where the restoration work needs to begin. In is is sort of saving those plants before they those old trees before they get swamped by uh, by the surrounding crop. There, there are certain species of tree which which are, are better indicators of, of ancient woodlands. So sessile oaks um, in an ancient woodland are, 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 are more of a pointer. Um, uh, pedunculate oaks probably less so because because they were planted more as, as timber trees over over a long long time. Um, there, there are several tree species which which Sort of together point at, at woodlands which have probably got an older history. Um, this is a witch elm. This this, this tree here is, is, is probably the only mature witch elm tree that I know um, in the area that probably predates the, um, the Dutch elm disease. So more, more commonly witch elms, the trees uh, died off but then regrew from the uh, from, from the dead stumps and, and they sort of continue to do that. They, they live to the age till 25, 30 years old and then su succumb to the disease again, but they keep on sort of coming back. So, so you find young elms and, and um, coppice stalls, but, but very rarely mature elm trees. Uh, other ancient woodland indicator trees, th this is one of my favorite, small leaf lime. Again, there's very, very few of those in, in North Wales. This is a, a tree just outside where, where I live and um, uh, I suppose it was nearly two years ago, uh, Johnny from the, the, the Wildlife Trust and, and Sarah were up um, collecting seeds from this tree. Uh, we're really keeping our fingers crossed that, that, uh, that this year we, we may see some, some results from those seeds because they actually take nearly, nearly two years to, uh, to be able to, to germinate those seeds. So we're really hopeful that uh, we'll have a new generation of small leaf lime trees to come in the future. Um, they're, they're, they're a tree which are more common in the southeast and in, in England, where um, I think the milder conditions probably suit them a, a, a bit better. But, but it is an important tree to, to bear in mind, assuming that our climate is going to be changing. Um, you know, may, maybe a few more trees like this will give us a little bit more resilience to, to future climate change. Um, another another lovely tree, the field maple, is 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 again a bit of a, an ancient woodland indicator. You find these a lot in hedgerows and and. I sort of don't distinguish a great deal between woodlands and hedgerows. Effectively, hedgerows are linear woodlands to, to me. I'm sure there's people who would argue with me about that. Um, but but it's a similar sort of process. There, there, there are ancient hedgerows like, like there are ancient woodlands, uh, which and, and they're really important reservoirs of, of, of ancient woodland plants. Um, dead trees are, are also a hugely important part of what makes ancient woodlands. Um, yeah, some people argue, argue, you know, probably justifiably, that, that dead trees are almost more important than live trees in woodlands. Um, I was watching Winter Watch last night, and Chris Packham mentioned I think it was sixteen hundred invertebrate species that were uh, that we use an old an old rotting oak. Incredibly important trees, and, and that's you know the 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 species that that rely on those invertebrates as well the, the birds that rely on those and the, and the mammals as well it's uh, it, it's just an, an incredibly important sort of resource in in ancient woodlands what, one of the things that we often find <clears throat> in pause woodlands e even if we don't find um mature old trees is is stumps like this and, and this is an old oak stump uh, where the oak tree was cut down to plant the the conifer plantation um, but it didn't die, it just grew, regrew from the, from the cut stump. And these are some of the most important sort of features that, that we can find in, in pause woodlands because they 
represent a sort of below ground connectivity over this stump could well be sort of two or three hundred years old um and that connectivity to to the sort of previous generations of the wood of the woodland i think is is tremendously important um uh, well the, the 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 link which uh marcus sent you in includes a link to this fascinating ted talk by um by suzanne Simard, uh, who's a Canadian scientist, and if, if you've not seen it, I, I do recommend having a look at this. It's an absolutely fascinating talk. And she was researching um, the below ground communication um, between trees, tree roots, and particularly mycorrhizal fungi. And I think we're just, just starting to begin to understand just how complex um, that, that, that inter interrelation is. Um, and so, uh, the, the, the roots of trees are just inoculated with um, mycorrhizal fungi that grow through the through the roots through the soil into um, into neighboring trees. Trees can transfer uh, nutrients from one tree to another tree through this mycorrhizal network. Um, hormones, all sorts of messages that we barely understand can, can be can be um, transported. But through her research, she's been just starting to find how incredibly complex th this is. So trees of different um, species can, can communicate through their mycorrhizal fungi. Even um, it, she's even finding that, that, that a tree will have better links with, it, with its own offspring. An oak tree will have, will have links with, with acorns that are grow of its own acorns that are more complex than, than if you were to go and plant another young oak tree next to it is the, the level of, of communication between these trees is, is astounding and, and and to me that sort of reinforces the the importance of, of of ancient woodlands and and protecting what we've got because we're only just beginning to understand what we've got uh, but yeah if you get a chance to have a look at this do I, do have a look at this lecture um and i'm going to talk a little bit now about ancient woodland flora um these are probably sort of more more what we think about when we when we think about ancient woodland indicators. Um, there are indicator species of flora. It's, it's not an exact science. There's, there's no species where if you find the species in a wood, it tells you it is an ancient woodland, um, or that species is absent. It, it definitely isn't. It, it's um, it, it's more a case of if if you find a sort of cross section of these these species in a woodland, then it's certainly pointing in that direction and and with other research and, and with other mapping that that points to to a woodland that is an ancient woodland that what they have in common is is that they're generally um they don't spread particularly fast they they don't seed very prolifically um they find it difficult to sort of colonize new sites so often where you have an ancient woodland plant that's that's disappeared that's it it, it has no way of coming back again um so, so they're they're important for that reason. I'm, I'm going to go through a few of the ancient woodland um, indicator plants. Um, as, as as a basis, a lot of that science of of, of ancient woodland indicator flora um, was was originally um, done in in southern England in in the southeast. Um, some of that is sort of transferable to to where we are in Wales, and and, and some a little bit less so. This report is 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 the, the is, I suppose is, is my starting point for, for looking for ancient woodland indicators in, in Wales here. I, I hope that I'd be able to send you a, um, a link to this report, but I haven't been able to find it online at all. Um, we have got it as a PDF, so, so hopefully we, we might be able to send this, um, this on to, to anybody who's interest, interested afterwards. Um, so this, this report by, by Jill Castle of SL was done in 2008, I think. And, and in the report, there's, um, there's, there's tables of species, ancient, um, ancient woodland indicator species. Uh, and, and this is kind of the, the basis of a lot of the ancient woodland restoration surveys that, that, that I've done over the years. Um, another, another really useful source, I, I, I suspect that, that a few of you will recognize um, Francis Rose's Wildflower Key. Um, and, and in the text of that book, uh, he does mark ancient woodland indicator species. Again, it is not specific to Wales, but it but it's, it is quite a useful sort of uh, pointer to get started with. What, what I've actually done is 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 I've used the list in in this castle report. I've gone through my wildflower key and and you know highlighted the plants that might be ancient woodland indicators. I've done the same in my grasses key and in my ferns key, trying to uh, trying try, trying to profile the ones which uh, you know which are the plants to look out for. 
So some of the ancient woodland indicators are species that, that we're all familiar with. Um, the, the, these are bluebells, which are, yeah, and some species are better ancient woodland indicators than, than others. Um, bluebells you seem to find in, in, in a lot of woodlands. I, I think they're a useful, really useful ancient woodland indicator because they, um, because they're so sort of accessible. Everybody knows bluebells, everybody appreciates bluebells, and, and it's sort of, it's a good starting point in, in talking the language of, of, of ancient woodland flora. Um, there, there are plenty of others. I, I'm, I'm going to go through a few of the indicators that there, there are too many to, to, to highlight them all, but I'm, I'm going to go through a, a few of the, the, you know, we'll start with some of the, the more familiar ones. Wild garlic is, is another um, great ancient woodland indicator species doesn't um, spread, well, it, it spreads sort of through its roots and, and vegetatively, but um, has trouble crossing e even from one side of a track to another, you know, let alone a, across the road or, or colonizing new areas. So again, where, where you get um, wild garlic and, and bluebells tends to be a, a pointer towards ancient woodlands. Um, this is another one, people want to photograph. Actually, I, sh I should say that I think most of these photographs are taken in, in, in North Wales. Um, so so they're, they're mostly plants that, that there's a good chance of coming across. Dog's mercury um, is, is a common woodland plant, fairly um, un, unobtrusive sort of plant with, with these, this is, this is it in flower, you, you can barely even see the flowers, but it, but it can um, become quite dense and, and cover quite big areas, dog's mercury. Um, another indicator here, uh, wooden enemy enemy uh, is, is, is another one that, that people are often quite familiar with. Uh, I think this is wood anemone in uh, big coverts, just uh, just outside my salmon. Um, wood sorrel is, is is one of the really good indicators. When I'm I'm actually doing some ancient woodland surveys at the moment, um, just outside Bala, and it's it's not the ideal time to be serving for surveying for indicators of ancient woodlands, of course, because because a lot of them aren't aren't there to be seen. So the um, the wood anemone, there's there's absolutely no sign of that at all at this time of year. If I look really closely, I, I can just about find um, the evidence of bluebells, the the sort of died, the, the, the dead sticks that were the flower heads from uh, from last year. You can just about find it this year, this time of year, but it's a bit challenging. But but wood sorrel, it, it seems to persist. It still, still seems to be green all through the year. So so I'm quite fond of wood sorrel at the moment. It's it's, it's a nice pointer all through the year to, to ancient woodlands. Uh, not in flower at this time of the year, but but the uh, the, the uh, the green bits of the plant are still still visible. Um, wild daffodils are a lovely ancient woodland indicator plant, quite quite rare in in, in North Wales, and, and you kind of have to know where, where to find them. They're quite um, a delicate little little uh, little daffodil, quite different from the, the the garden daffodils, and quite typically have this very pale yellow um, outer petals. Uh, which, which are quite distinctive of it. There's a few places of I know. Actually, probably one of the best places to see wild, wild daffodils, ironically, um, is, is if you're traveling along the A5 towards Better Coid, um, late March, early April, when, when they're in flower. If, if, if you look out just before Conway Falls, you'll, you'll sometimes see these, these really pale clumps of, uh, of, of little daffodils. And, and those, I think, are wild daffodils there. Lovely little plants. Uh, this is another ancient woodland indicator, yellow pimpernel, uh, quite subtle little one, but when it's in flower, they're quite distinctive, little neat uh, five petal yellow flowers. It, it flowers quite quite late in the year. Um, and this is this is another one, which which again is you find from time to time. Uh, yellow archangel is is related to the nettles. It's got a very sort of nettle like structure to it and, and the flowers are, are quite nettle like and again quite quite a, a late flowering plant a, a lot of woodland flowers flower pretty early in the year because they, they want to get the flowers out before the canopy closes in but there are there are a few uh, which, which, which come to flower a little bit later so it's, it's nice to have that sort of spread throughout the year um, just a couple of others that, that you may well be familiar with uh, greater stitch work um, up at the top, which, which you, you, you often see in hedgerows, and, and that's sort of partly why I refer to as hedgerows as sort of linear woodlands. It's, it's, it's a woodland plant which particularly likes hedgerows. Uh, the wild red currant in the bottom left, I, I like those because it's, it's good to be able to do woodland surveys and actually be able to eat something as you're going along, so that's, that's got to be a bonus. Um, and then up on, on the right hand side, uh, goldenrod is, is, is another quite late flowering ancient woodland indicator. 
this is one of my one of my favorites it's it's uh it's quite typical of uh sort of lime limestone woodlands it's a plant called herb paris um so herb paris there's a couple of little hot spots for that uh, in book big covid and my seven also uh Castlewood uh, down outside Rithin, there's 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 quite a few clusters of that. I, I like it because it's the name Herb Paris um, doesn't refer to the city in France. It, it actually refers to it comes from the word par, uh, which which refers to order and regularity. And there was going back to sort of medieval times. There was there was a popular idea at the time, which was the the doctrine of signatures, and the, and the idea was that God had created uh, people and, and created plants and things that specifically to be useful for us. Um, and so very cunningly, he'd put little clues in, uh, in, in, in these plants to tell us what their uses were. And a lot of the plants that have got the name Wurt um, are, are, are come, from, come from those, the names come from those sort of times. So kidney wort and, and spleen wort, there were sort of vague suggestions in the plants that, that this is what, what they might be useful for for us. Um, and Herb Paris got its name because of its its symmetry, because of its regularity and and, and its order. There was no it was it was thought that it, it was a cure for insanity because it's so ordered and, and so regular. So there, Herb, Herb Paris. This is it in all its flowering glory. It's uh, it's it's not the most uh, beautiful of plants, but but still quite striking. Um, <laughs> and another another one of the words. This is fig words. Another one from the doctrine of signatures. And apparently, I'm told, um, figs were an old word, word for hemorrhoids. And these little uh, flowers and the little seed heads were said to be reminiscent of hemorrhoids. So it's thought to be a cure of hemorrhoids. So there you go. If you've ever tried fig word, I really don't want to know. Um, another ancient woodland indicator, I've, I've included this one, and this is Climbing Corridalis, which is a fine name. I just included that, that in because I took that photo last week. Um, it's one of the, the few ancient woodland indicator plants which you can still find. It's probably easy to find at this time of year. Um, in the late summer when it flowers, it, it sort of sprawls through, through bracken and, and, and willow herb and, and taller plants, and it's actually quite difficult to find, but actually it, it maintains its sort of... Uh, it's green, it maintains its chlorophyll at this time of year, so this is probably the easiest time to find it. So it's, it's a little bit swings and roundabouts what time of year you, you survey woodlands, there's things that you won't find, whatever time of year it is, but there, there are other things that, uh, that you can look out for. Uh, just a couple more, the, uh, the, the flashier ones, um, the early purple orchid on the left. Uh, nestled in amongst the bluebells uh, is a lovely little ancient woodland ind indicator. The, the less glamorous, I suppose, on, on the right is the bird's nest orchid. <coughs> and, and this photo was taken uh, by in big cover top by, uh, by Mice Heaven. Uh, this, this is a plant which is a parasite of uh, particularly of beech, uh, beech tree roots. So where, wherever you get these beech plantations, it, there's always a chance of this subtle little plant. And, and it has no, this is as, as uh, spectacular as the plant gets it's it has no chlorophyll so so this is it in, in all its glory but a really nice plant to find um if, if you're looking hard so as well as as well as the trees uh as well as the the flowers that there, there are various other flora which are which are good indicated various other plants sorry which are which are good indicators of ancient woodland there are some uh good ancient woodland indicator ferns um, so not not all ferns are ancient woodland indicators. Some ferns, like broad buckler ferns and, and, and male ferns, are um, fairly universal. But th this is one of the this is scaly male fern, um, wh which is more of a, an, an ancient woodland specialist. Um, actually, quite quite a good time of year. I, I didn't know much about ferns before I started serving ancient woodlands, and, and I had to learn pretty quickly. Um, the, the early spring is quite a good time time of year for, for starting to, to learn the ferns as, as they're coming out. Um, is some of them can be, be teased apart because uh, some ferns keep their green throughout the winter winter time, and others don't. So the male fern uh, completely dies back in the in, in the winter time. Uh, so it's, there's nothing, you know, there's only dead branches and, and uh, leaves to see in the uh, in the spring, whereas this scaly male fern keeps keeps a lot of its green, so that's that's one way of telling them apart. Um, other woodland uh, woodland, woodland indicator ferns, the um, the shield ferns on the left hand side. Uh, this is soft shield fern, I think. 
Um, hard fern up, up at the top right is, is one that's that is one of the easier ones to recognize, quite a distinctive looking fern and it, it has its vegetative parts are quite distinct from its flowering parts, which have these sort of fine feathery um, sort of comb like structures. So, so hard fern is a good ancient woodland indicator. And then bottom right is poddy poddy, which is, is the, the fern that you see growing on old trees, particularly on, on old oak trees. It's, it's a really typical plant of, of ancient woodlands. Um, this isn't one of my photos, and I'm not sure where it's taken, but it, this is a really, really, really discreet little plant called Wilson's filmy fern. Quite difficult to find. We only really find them in the in the sort of wet western Oakland woodlands. But uh, a lovely little plant, just one cell thick. The, the leaves. It's a really delicate little plant. But yeah, Wilson's filmy fern, tough one to find. Um, <clears throat> and then, as, as well as the, the the flowers and the ferns, there are some some um, ancient woodland indicated grassland grasses. Excuse me. Um, and again, I, I'm not a botanist. I'm, I'm not a certainly not a, a grass expert. Um, but but using uh, the lists like like the the list in in that castle report, you, you can it is possible to sort of zero in on the ancient woodland grasses to, to try and become familiar with them. And some of them are quite distinctive. And in the left hand side, this is uh, wood melic, which is a really distinctive little grass with the um, those those individual. Um, heads that, that sort of you know grow down the uh, grow down the stems. On the right hand side is wavy hair grass, which is which is quite a typical typical grassland of sort of western oak woodlands. Um, really, really fine leaves, and uh, as the name suggests, the, these sort of little wavy hairs that that, that make up the uh, the flower head. Uh, as well as the grasses, there's one or two, um, even for non botanists like me, there's one or two that are fairly distinctive and fairly easy to learn. Uh, pendulous sedge up in the top left is 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 a good ancient woodland indicator. Um, a couple of the wood rushes, the great wood rush down in the uh, in, in the bottom right, can actually become quite quite dominant in some woodlands, and again is a good ancient woodland indicator. Um, <clears throat> if I don't know much about moss about grasses, I know even less about mosses, unfortunately. And it is quite possible that the mosses a study of mosses is is probably an even more effective way of, of, of telling ancient woodlands that there are certain mosses which are really, really um, tuned into ancient woodlands and, and, and just don't occur outside them. So Thuidium in, in the top left is one, uh, Medium Horn and down, down in the bottom right is, 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 is another. And I take my hats off to the people who, who do know their mosses because it's, 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 it's a really useful skill. They just don't quite seem to be enough limed, lifetimes to, uh, to learn everything there is to learn. Um, this, this is quite a distinctive liverwort, which is an ancient woodland indicator. Um, tree lungwort, uh, again, I suppose, doctrine of signatures. It's got that sort of lungy sort of texture to it. I hope, yes, yes, hopefully your lungs aren't that green. But uh, this photo was actually taken up in Scotland where, where, where they're quite common on the, uh, on the trees there. They really like wet conditions and, and, and um, over in, in the far west of Wales, in, in the sort of Merionid oak woods, you see quite a lot of this. Uh, uh, tree lung word. Um, and like like mosses that the, the fungi are also quite quite effective as, as, as ancient woodland indicators for those who are in the know um, and and the, the complexity of, of, of what is going on in woodland soils and what is going underground is is, is, is astounding. The, the fruiting bodies are, are just effectively the flowers that we see but there's an awful lot going on underground as well. So so that's a real snapshot. Um, I could have talked for twice as long about ancient woodland <laughs> indicator plants, um, but so that's just a, a, a little bit of a snapshot. I want to just talk a, a little bit of, a, about the ancient woodlands and, and, and about the future of them. Um, so as, as I said right at the beginning, ancient woodlands are really scarce resource, a really limited resource. They're not making any more. Um, it, and it makes it particularly important to protect what we've got left. Um, we, we can't create new ancient woodlands, but, but we can improve connectivity between ancient woodlands and we can, we can create um, ancient woodlands of the future, I guess. Um, so planting trees is, 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 you know, isn't necessarily going to, going to create you, um, ancient woodlands, but I, there's something relentlessly positive about, about planting trees, um, particularly planting hedgerows that, that, that do allow species of, of, um, uh, of plant and, and of animal to sort of move between existing woodlands. 
Um, I, <clears throat> I, I, my colleague, I worked uh, for the RSPB um, in South Wales, and, and my colleague always complained that if you wanted to improve things for birds, um, if you worked in, in wetland, you just needed to sort of plug up some dams and within a couple of years, you'd, you'd be having waders and, uh, and wildfowl using your site really, really quickly. Whereas if you want to create a woodland, you're gonna to have to step back for a couple of hundred years and wait for the, wait for the full effects. But I actually find that quite a positive thing in, in, in a way that, that when we're planting trees, we're not just planting them for ourselves, but we're planting them for, for future generations and generations in, in hundreds of years time. Um, the other the other thing that we can do to, to improve things for ancient woodlands is is revolves around that sort of nearly 50% of our ancient woodlands that, that have been damaged, mostly since the Second World War by by being felled and, and, and replanted with, with non native trees. Of, there's, there's a lot of different ways that, that those original ancient woodlands were treated, some of them were clear felled. Um, that, that's probably more often um, the conifers were planted. Sometimes they were, um, I, I assume that they were sort of chemically sprayed where, where there's very little sign of anything under them. Just occasionally you find, find woodlands like, like this one just near where I live where um, a lot of the, the old oak trees remained. I, I don't really know why, but they, they underplanted um, conifers there. So there's a, a lot of scope for, for restoring woodlands, particularly like this one. If, if you left this woodland for another the 20 years, the, the, the conifers would be growing up above the oaks. It would be shading them out. And, and some of those oak trees ha have already succumbed. But there is the chance to start restoring a woodland like this, starting with these old remnant oak trees. And, and um, you can halo thin around those, those trees to give them, give them room, room to breathe while you're, you're beginning that process of, of, of restoration. Um, and as I said, re restoration isn't usually just a matter of, of, of felling the non-native trees and, and replanting them. Um, it's, it's, it's more complex than that. It's a, ideally, it's a sort of slow, gradual process of, of um, freeing up these, these trees over 10, 20, 50 years. It's, 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 a, long, it's a long process. Um, but but eventually, as as at the same time as you're freeing up those trees, you're you're also encouraging the remnant bluebells and dogs mercury and and, and the grasses which have just about hung on in there, um, and you're you're allowing them to flourish as well. So there is enormous um, potential for for restoring ancient woodlands, and and there's a lot of work being done by the woodland trust, by by the wildlife trust in 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 in, wood, in ancient woodland restoration, and it, it it is a gradual process. A lot of forestry these days is is highly mechanized it's, it's a matter of big machinery coming um, cutting all the trees down taking them away planting another crop and coming back in 50 years time to take that one away um, ancient woodland restoration is is a slow gradual process but but it allows you to manage woodlands continually and sustainably um, forever more basically but but the the lower impact um, uh, machinery that, that that you can use in in, in these woodlands then probably the better uh, the, the, the horse logging here actually is, isn't, unfortunately, I couldn't find a photo of the, the horse logging in, uh, in big covert, but it, it is interesting and, and you can see it in the woodlands that are, that are being cleared there, the different impacts of, of the areas that were done using, um, using tractors to, to harvest the, to take the timber away and, and the areas that were done using horses, the, the ground impact is, is incredible within a couple of years, it's, it's hard to even see they were there, so. Uh, so I think I'll probably draw that part of the presentation to a close now. Um, Mark, I'm hoping, has been able to uh, field any questions that, uh, that, that, that people might, uh, might have, have been putting out there, and I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, that people might have. So over to you, Mark. Not, not many questions in the chat at the moment, but as, if anyone's got any, please do put them in there for you. But um, we've been having a bit of a conversation on the side about it. So Julian Fairborn commented that when she grew up in Essex, the woods there seemed to be full of wood and enemy, but she's not seen anywhere near as much in Wales. Actually, she says she's never seen any in Wales. So, yeah, actually, that that would I, I don't know if, if people would know big big covert wood. It's it's an interesting wood to visit, um, but uh, there's this like, like like a lot of sort of similar woods. You, you can spend a, a, a lot of time walking around there. Um, not seeing much but it, but if you happen to go at the right time of year so so the early spring 
the the wooden enemy there grows in sort of clusters you can you can walk around the wood and not see much and then suddenly you'll, you'll stumble across clumps of it i'm not really sure why it grows the, the way it does but um in, in the right time of year it, it is a, a plant that, that that you will come across where it often seems to grow in association with bluebells where, where you get bluebells you do often get wooden enemy with it Good. Um, Yuan's been commenting as well, um, Yuan from the Wildlife Trust, who was on with us at the start, saying um, that in Coid Kligers, Shuid and Puck Glass, they have a show of wild daffodils in spring, and um, the Herb Paris is also found at both our Aberdeen and Coid Development Nature Reserve, which is great great to know, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, brilliant. And and if yeah, and if you get, get an opportunity to, uh, to to go on a, a on a walk with you and or, or with anyone from the Wildlife Trust, it's a it's a great opportunity to, uh, to to find out some of those sort of little little hidden gems which uh, which you might not notice otherwise. Um, Maria's asking, would you um, is the list of indicator species within that PDF which I yeah. will follow to everyone? Brilliant. So I'll send that to everyone yeah. via email afterwards. Yeah, that's right. The actual the actual document is is quite a, a long complex complex document, but I I saved as a PDF just the just the table, just the uh, the appendix, which is which is that list of indicators. So for for me, I, you know, it's, it's funny. It's it's a really useful resource and, and not one that is actually easy to find. So once somebody somebody sent me that, it's kind of like gold dust, really. So so there you go. You're you're especially privileged to uh, <laughs> to be able to see that. It's um, I'll, I'll probably have to e email it from my direct email because it's quite a, well. It's, I think it's eleven pages long the PDF, so I'm not sure if I can attach okay. it easily. But I'll get it out to everyone for you. Um, Julia in Fairbourne's also recommended watching um, a clip on YouTube called Judy Dench and her love of trees, which she thought people might find informative. So I'll stick that into the email as well. If anyone wants to look at that. Um, why not? And, and, yeah, well, why not? I've just had a quick look at it whilst the talk was on and I'm going to watch it afterwards. So I'll stick it in the chat for everyone um, or in the email. And we've also got Anna Williams on, who's um, our education officer in the for the Wildlife Trust in, for Northwest Wales. She does the same job as you, Anne, but in, but in the Bangor Gwynedd area. And she said some a good reading tip. It's Finding the Mother Tree by Suzanne Simard as well. So I don't know if you've heard of that one. Oh, okay, yeah. So Suzanne Simard is is the, the person I referred to who, who's done that TED talk. Uh, ah, okay. And I mentioned it at the time, but I really do recommend it. If you get a chance to that, it's quite to see that it's quite an eye opener. It just it's it opens up a whole new world uh, within woodlands and uh, really quite inspiring person. Well, I've just I've, I've just I was, when you were going through that part of the talk, I was getting um, really big kind of Lord of the Rings vibes. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> we've been watching all the films again over Christmas, and I, was, <laughs> I had visions of the Ents talking to um, the different trees. <laughs> <laughs> good i'm glad to hear that <laughs> <laughs> so well i think i think that's it um there's no more, no more actual questions and there's lots of um thank yous and people saying that it's been really informative and they really enjoyed the talk nigel so yeah it's been really 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 good i've um i've learned a lot um and i'm going to be kicking on those links i used to use a similar one from the national library in scotland for looking at old maps and it, and you know going back and from flicking through and looking at you know just the places you live and what the reserves used to be it's just absolutely you know you can get lost in it for hours and hours can't you mm -hmm, absolutely so um yeah i'll get all those links to everything if there's anything else that you want me to send out to everyone nigel let me know tomorrow and i'll send it all out via email tomorrow but again lots of thank yous from everyone in the chat so thank you for tonight it's been it's been really really good really informative and i've thoroughly enjoyed it and, and from the comments it looks like everyone else as well well thank you for inviting me it's, it's been a real pleasure no problem. All right, I'm going to end it there then for everyone. Um, and like I said, this will be up on YouTube again. So I will, um, I'll send you that link as well to everyone once it's up on our YouTube page so you can all watch it again. Okay. All right, take care, everyone. Have a nice evening. Bye.